progress. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters, and good morning. As we look to continue our study, and we look to open the word of the Lord, shall we seek his guidance so that we may more clearly understand that which is presented before us? Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this Sabbath hours. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to open your word and the words of your prophet so that we may more clearly understand that which is now before us. Direct us now, help us to understand these passages from Zephaniah and how they are related with other warnings that are given to us throughout scripture. Direct us now, help us so that we may be prepared for the outpouring of your spirit, for the work that you would have us to do, and so that we may be cleansed, so that we may be fit vessels for that which is before us. Direct us now, be with us in all ways. For this we thank you and this we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, as we left off this last week, we had gone through a specific portion a manuscript seven. And the admonition that was given to us there read as follows. The Lord of heaven permits the world to choose whom they will have as a ruler. Let all read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation, for it concerns every human agent, great and small. <clears throat> We are being told that Revelation 13 has great import for every person, for every human being. It matters not what race, it matters not what gender. There are many races, there are but two genders. Every man. Every woman, every human being must take sides, either for the true and living God who has given to the world the memorial of creation in the seventh day Sabbath, or for a false Sabbath instituted by men who have exalted themselves above all that is called God or that is worshiped, who have taken upon themselves the attributes of Satan in oppressing the loyal and true who keep the commandments of God. This persecuting power will compel the worship of the beast by insisting on the observance of the Sabbath that he has instituted. Thus he blasphemes God, sitting in the temple of God and showing himself that he is God. sitting in the temple of God and showing himself. Not showing the world, but showing to the world that in his mind, he is God. Now, the last two verses that we did not read last week read as follows. And that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is six hundred, three score, and six. There was a good bit 
that Theodore gave in last Sabbath afternoon's presentation that was right in line with this. This was not a decision that was reached beforehand. This was the providence of God. This worship of a false Sabbath is a wedge that split the Protestant churches from God and left them naked. They had not a text of scripture to sustain their false God, but yet a deception, hoary with age, but still a deception, was commended to reverence and exalted while the Sabbath of the fourth commandment was trampled upon and God dishonored. The Bible was before them with a plain, thus saith the Lord. And the penalty that is the part of the transgressor. But as Adam and Eve and Eden listened to the falsehoods of Satan, so the righteous world are following their example. What does this say to us today? Yeah, there's lots here that it says, uh, you know, because dealing with the verses there that we read, verse 17 and 18 in Revelation 13, because uh, I'd asked the question about buying and selling. And what does this particularly mean? Um, because we don't take this literally. I mean, we do in a sense, but we know that it's it's symbolic. Right. And and so when we deal with the, the merchants of the earth, etc., um, what is it that they're selling? And Aren't they not proselytizing? They're selling the they're selling their idea of what um, God's word means, not what it says, but what it means. Yeah. That's so in order, to, yeah. So in order to buy or, or sell here, you have to have the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. So, and there's three different ones, the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. And why are there three and what's the difference between them? Are they just a repeat and enlarge? Are they the same thing? Just a dip, they're describing the same thing in three different ways or are they three different things? If you we know, have... what just came to me, I mean, sorry, we have the, the gematria. So whatever this beast is going to call himself or his policies, maybe we can check on that. Okay. I don't know. Well, you know, in the studies that we, we dealt with, um, we had, uh, what's his name? Um, my mind's going blank. The guy who did the thing on the papacy, um, the number of the name of the papacy. Uh, adding up to 666 using the names since 1798 and uh, an interesting structure. Oh, I just can't think of his name. It'll come to me when I don't need it. Um, and then, uh, no, it wasn't Pickle. Pickle was uh, um, the guy who wrote about Revelation uh, 17. Um, I just can't think of it. Anyway, now, now the name of the beast the name refers to uh, character, right? And then you have the mark. So is how would we look at these things, these mark, this name, and this number? The way that it had been taught for many years was that <clears throat> the mark on the hand was accepting and working toward the promotion of the false Sabbath 
and that the, the mark on the forehead was the mental agreement, the mental assent. Right. But are we to look at this in a different manner? And I think that's entirely correct. We have to look at this in a symbolic manner. Well, yeah, but obviously it's symbolic. So we, we don't believe that there's actually literally a mark. No. On the right hand or the forehead. Um, just like with the seal of God, we're not going to see a, a visible mark upon those who keep the Sabbath. Um, and we know that to, to receive the seal is intellectually and spiritually settled in, into the truth so that we cannot be moved. Um Isn't the mark a way to distinguish a person? Well, I mean, th this idea or symbol, there's, there's, there's the mark of those who sigh and cry in Ezekiel uh, chapter 9, right? So the man with the writer's ink horn. Um, and we also know that the, uh, somebody who chooses to become a servant um, can can receive uh they bore a hole through the ear um so so i mean we're not looking for a literal mark so we're looking for something that's symbolic and the only ones that can buy or sell have this mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name but does that mean they have all three or just one, they just need to have one of those. And what's the distinction or the differentiation between a mark, a name, and a number? So if you break one, you break them all. So it could be just one, just, a, just my comment. Yeah, it, the question is we don't even really know what these are. I mean, we have to define what they are if we're going to and we know that the mark is in the right hand or their forehead. Um, so does this mark mean that it has the name as well, as well as the number? And if it does, what, what does that mean symbolically? I mean, I'm asking the questions because, you know, we need to examine that. Well, with the brand, the brand always always refers to the owner of the livestock. I mean, if people are, are clothed people, I mean, with this environmental thing, for instance, mm -hmm. if you, know, you just have to listen to what they say and watch the way they live, and you know that the, whether they realize it now or not, they're following the papal agenda. And if they don't quit it, they're going to be lost. Okay, so we know so that... Yeah, so we are in the brand right there. Yeah, so we know that we've compared the mark of the beast with the seal of God, and that the seal of God contains uh, the territory. Um, can't remember the three things that it has: the name, the title, and the territory uh, that God claims. So He's the Creator, He's Jehovah, and He created heaven and earth, the sea, and all that in them is. Um, so it's a sign of his authority, and this mark is a sign of papal authority. And so we know that this, um, you know, we looked at the, the merchants, and, and we know that that's symbolic. It's not that, you know, the business owners are, are mourning the loss of, of the papacy. It's symbolic of something. And so I think that, that many of us take this way too literally, even people in this movement, you know, especially when people are looking for some kind of, uh, uh, you know, tracker, tracker, some kind of technology that's going to track us. Because I don't think that that's what this is talking about at all. I don't think so either. Yeah. Because we haven't defined what buy and or sell means, you know, symbolically. Okay, so um, some of the terminology that um, I use 
almost daily is when I'm talking with people. Uh, one of the things I say when I agree with somebody is, I'll buy that. That's just one of those things. Or I reject that. And then when I make a deal with somebody, I usually shake their hands. That's being in my right hand. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, don't, I don't know if this has it, but this is sim symbolic of what I do. Uh, I, I buy what people say uh, only through, you know, thoughtful um, um, consideration. Okay. So the one thing that we do when we talk about buying and selling, we used to just think about going to the store. But often buying and selling, especially in ancient times, is a covenantal relationship. Yes. Right. Uh, and one of the things we see in ancient documents, like in the cuneiform um, tablets, is most of them are, are contracts of buying and selling. Right. So wouldn't this represent some kind of counterfeit uh, covenant with the man of sin? Yes. I just chatted Isaiah 55, 1 through 3, and I really think it has some bearing on this. Right. So, ho, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and he that hath no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Wherefore do ye spend money for that which is not bread, and your labor for that which satisfieth not? Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good, and let your soul delight itself in fatness. Incline your ear, and come unto me, hear, and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. So we can see that this buying and selling in this context is a covenant relationship with God. It's an invitation on God's part for us. What to book was that? It's Isaiah 55, verses 1 to 3. Thank you. It was in the chat there that she posted it. Um, so then we would have to look at this in Revelation 13 as a counterfeit covenant, right? So the Sabbath is the sign and the seal of our covenant with God. And the sign or the seal or the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name is the sign of the covenant that man makes with the world. So the question, why, why, do, why is this verse, verse 18, here is wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is a number of a man, and his number is 603 score and six. Because what is really being asked of those who are reading the book of Revelation. Aren't we being asked to pay attention to the time in which we live? Yeah, because because throughout the book, we have to read and hear. He that hath an ear, let him hear. So there is something that we have to pay attention to that God is asking us to pay attention to. And, and we need to have this understanding. So the counting of the number of the beast, one of the things that we have seen is it relates to periods of time. It connects uh, Ezekiel's prediction of the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 to the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD, right, being... Uh, 666th year of Jehoiachin's captivity when the temple is destroyed the second time. And also on the same date it was destroyed, the 10th day of the fifth month in 586. And then you have um, Miller's understanding of the 666 days 
as being years, right? So, I mean, 666 number as being years. And then we have another period that can be drawn from that. Um, so he starts his in uh, 158, but we can start in 129 as well. And we're going to come to the two dates, 508 and 538, one an ordinal count and one a cardinal count. Um, and these tie together in a structure uh, that tie to our history. I don't know if everybody remembers Stephen's uh, application of it and the 1335 and how that applied. So why don't you address that? Okay, well, uh, the primary thing was we were studying a league, right? Correct. And that league happened when? Well, if, if we're looking at this, we have the, the league beginning in 161 and more or less ratified in 158 BC. Yeah, so if I can share my screen here. Okay. Um, right, so you have this uh, 1493 to 2001. We have this, this structure that Stephen drew out. And so you have the Israelites league with the Gibeonites. And there's the three days that's there. And so we noted that three days can represent three years. And it happens that 158 BC is 1335 years from that league. And we can see there it's 666 times two years plus the three years to make 1335. And that's the league is going to actually be made in 161, but it's ratified in 158 in that it's put into effect. And then you have the 666 years of Miller. So in this one, we don't have the other periods of 666 years. But we can see that to 1840, there's going to be 666 times two years from 508, and then a further three years to the end of the 1335 years. So we can see we have this same structure in these two periods of 1335 years. And that you're going to have the arrival of the second angel, he notes there. Plus, if we take this period of time from 1493 to 508, it's 2001 years, which is an inclusive count. And then um, if we go from 508 and we take 1493 years, uh, we come to 2001. Um, when the second angel arrives in our history. So, and, and that 1843, of course, is the end of the Jewish year, 1843. And then you see the period of 158 years, uh, which could go back to the symbol of 158 BC, and then also the 161 years, which is, goes to 161 BC. And then also another period of 2,100 years, or 2,001 years, I mean, from 158 to 1843. So you have these structures, these spans of time, uh, going into this wheel within a wheel um, that ties us back to the past and brings us to the present. So is this what is being asked of us to count the number of his name, to understand Satan's counterfeit of Christ's work. That would make sense in a certain manner. Okay, explain. Well, um, all these periods that we have, like the 666 times 2, which is the 1335, mm -hmm. right? Or I'm sorry, it's not the 1335, or is it? No, it's the 1335. It's the 1335. Okay. So 666 times 2 plus 3 years is 1335. Right. And then we have 158 BC and 508 BC, we have them 666 years. Yeah. Now that was between the destruction of. No, that was 
I'm sorry. The, these, these are between leagues that are being. Yeah, made. these are the leagues here. Yeah, there's different types of leagues. There's the league that the Jews make with Rome and in 508. Is there a league made in 508? Um, yeah, wasn't there? Um, that was Clovis's uh, baptismal, right? Yeah. So, so you have Clovis. Yes. And, yeah. And then we see God's, in, in a sense, God's interaction with this. So we have the workings of Satan, these counterfeit systems. And, and there's lots more we could add to the structure because you could put the two uh, 1260s in here and you could put the 2520 in there, all part of a, of a structure, right? If we look at these periods of time, like a clock with all these different wheels and mm -hmm. cogs interacting with each other, we see that they're all related. And so it's, it's a rather complex system just like any watch would be right all these different gears and wheels and whatever how all the different parts of a watch um that tell us the time and this tells us the time we're living in by looking at these prophetic periods and seeing uh, how they point to our day so you asked me how i got to that and <laughs> the main um question was if you have wisdom right mm -hmm. well i mean the 666 aspect of it we can figure that part out but it seems to me that there'd be some you know it's that's just like a face value thing and we always know that he has um he unfolds stuff and we see a little bit clearer on certain things and and we didn't have all these 666s before um, this is just something new that we've kind of come up with within the last few years. Okay. Well, yeah. So, uh, I mean, Miller had the 666 years and then, in well, yeah, but we didn't have all of these, all of these every six years. That's, no, I know. And then and we didn't have the multiples, but we're starting to gain this, this information. It would kind of make sense to me because of the way that I've, that we've been, um, getting our information it comes to us when we need it for one reason uh and we get this we get this flash of light that comes out of jesus hand in a sense this is wouldn't you say that this is some sort of light that's coming from jesus mm -hmm. um and now we start looking at this the question of uh this puzzle um, for those of us, for those that would have wisdom, you know, to try to figure out the number of his name, it, 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 it pushes, it's pushing the bounds, but you know, it makes sense. <laughs> I, yeah. I, yeah. So, and, and we can see, you know, here's a, just a diagram of the 666 years from Jehoiachin's captivity, uh, to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. It's just the same drawing, other ways of drawing it. Um, this is just showing you the 36 years at the beginning and the end. And, um, you know, this is a rather complex structure. But, you know, here I have Miller's 666 years and the other two periods of 666 years, all within this structure um, of of time and so i mean it becomes complex right so so dwight you can share your screen again um so when we when we look at this this passage i mean as seventh-day adventists i mean we just sort of read over it and we don't notice some of the details one is the mark the name and the number being three different ones and there's a, a buy or sell so I don't know what that means because it just doesn't say buy, but or to sell. And, and then we're asked to have this wisdom, to have understanding, to count the number of the beast, to do some kind of calculation, for it is a number of a man, and his number is 300, three score and six. So, I mean, this just isn't talking about avoiding some kind of physical mark. 
or even uh, just, you know, knowing that Saturday is the Sabbath and Sunday is the mark of the beast and, and, and just sort of avoiding getting this mark of the beast, whatever it is. And the thing is, people are receiving the mark of the beast and completely unaware of it. So um, can we say that, um, that if we were to, and, and we know this, we know this happens, uh, we get shut down in Adventist church if we start bringing in 2520 and these types of things. Mm -hmm. um, can you say, or can we say that because Adventism has accepted the things that it has, that um, they now possess a mark and um, if we don't have that mark or agree with that mark in mind or hand or in the way we do things, uh, can that be referred to as they won't let us sell? Into in, you know because I when because when I it's a pitch, yeah, and, you know, and I, yeah, and I think that's part of the the main thing is it's it's about being able to uh, share the gospel, and it, it would fit in closely with the symbology. Yeah. I'm sorry about the. Yeah. yeah. Well, it looks like to me that there is definitely the Lord is giving us multiple ways to distinguish and to recognize these these people that um, are following the Antichrist that are not following and having a covenant with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Um, there is a restriction being placed upon the sharing of of light from god's word even in the adventist church absolutely but we also had this in this movement right? uh yes and and to me that was the same thing it doesn't matter where it happens um the examination of truth is something that has to happen um when we're when we're christians we have to follow the counsel that's given in the word of god and um, so people are receiving the mark of the beast. Um, so Ran asks a question. So February 16th, are you referring to February 16th, 2021? Or, or, or 2022, I mean. Yeah, 2022. Um, right, so that was... Well, that's part of it, right? So what he's referring to here is that's the first date where the Canadian group uh, did not share my link to my meetings or any reference to them. But we have other things. We have the December 6th declaration in, in 2020. So we have throughout this movement, throughout history, throughout Adventism, Throughout time, there have been those who have tried to shut down God's word. And often with the justification that they're trying to protect people from error. Right. How do you protect people from error? Um, by allowing them, for me, it would be to allow them to experience for themselves the truth and the error presented in those two different passions. Yeah. And, and you present truth, as Iran puts there. So if somebody's in error, it doesn't really do much good to shut them down. Because one is they might have sympathizers who see them treating unjustly, being treated unjustly. And um, and it's, you're just going to sort of prop propagate the error. But yeah, also... We went over this with yeah. uh, the uh, Methodist at Exeter, I believe it was. Um, yeah, well, you're talking about the, the Waterton tent. Waterton, I'm sorry. Or Watertown or whatever it is. And the, comp and the comments that uh, was made about that, that they were, they were wrong in moving away from them. So, you know, we have to deal with people, whether they're... Um, you know, in error or not, I mean, 
Yeah, but if you're okay. going to and if you're going to protect others who might be influenced, the best thing you can do is present the truth, and you can see Absolutely. the truth is in con its contrast with error. Right. So. Right, I agree. Can always, can always be examined. Um, so you know, there's still more here that we don't see yet. Um, being at the mark of the beast, but we see more than we used to. Uh, I'm trying. I'm not trying to, but I keep seeing a flash uh, of Judges two twenty three, and no Judges two twenty four. Yeah, so you're talking about uh, the fact that we take the uh, Judges chapter 2 and, and it's a history from 9-11 to 2023. Right, and so when I see stuff like that, um, to me it's it's all part of the progression, you know, and we're going to reach a certain plateau and what, I, what I'm theorizing, not, you know, I'm not trying to say that this is the way it's going to be, but I'm, what I'm theorizing is it's 23. There's going to be some sort of uh, something that is going to uh, either be an end of the test mm -hmm. because aren't we saying that this is actually a test testing period? Yeah. Because, yeah. Cause the enemies were kept allowed to, whatever they they were there god allowed them to to exist that's right he didn't extract them he didn't he didn't uh he told them that i wasn't going to move these guys because they you, I mean, you need a a test yeah I'm paraphrasing so, yeah it says therefore the lord left those nations with without driving them out hastily right neither delivered he them into the hand of joshua so so often we see error and we drive it out hastily but, but th those that error that we're confronted with, Ellen White says that you know heresy is brought in or allowed in so that we can uh, find out the truth. That we're we're challenged then to examine things, and but yet people often avoid that whole whole challenge. I mean, uh, you know, I'm, there's I'm truth and just... error, and we have to be able to discern between the two. Well, yeah, and the only way you can really discern between it is to is to experience what um, uh, the false part of it. I mean, because I learn more uh, from making mistakes than than I learn just from reading something. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, I can read a procedure and and follow the procedure, but if I lift one thing out, I make a mistake, and then I don't get the results at the end that I'm looking for. And so consequently, I end up beating myself up a little bit, and I never forget that again. Well, and we looked at the mistakes uh, last night and how God uses those mistakes. And, and sometimes, you know, even in presentations, I've made mistakes, and actually those mistakes become a way to examine something. They draw attention to sorting something out. They actually become like a teaching tool. So if I go through and I'm presenting something and I make a major mistake, you know, I get something confused and then we go back and correct it. It actually helps it stick in the person's mind much more re readily than if I had just presented it. I'm not saying I should make intent mistakes intentionally, but God sometimes allows those to, to draw our attention to something. And sometimes it actually helps us see something we wouldn't have seen. So anyway, Dwight, where do you want to go from here now? Well, I have a question for consideration. We brought up December 6th. We have brought up January 6th, right? Um, February 16th, you mean? February 16th, okay. Yeah, 2022. Can these be compared with Daniel chapter 9 verses 27 to the end of the chapter the 70 weeks it's the week of christ yeah the right. seven, yeah okay okay so daniel 9 verse 24 to 27 um explain how you would compare them well the 70th week 
was a warning, right? Um, well, it, it's it's about the covenant. Um, was Daniel not given a warning for his people? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Because would, you're going to have the camp, well, you're going to have the city rebuilt, but it's going to be destroyed again. Was this warning not based upon time? Uh, yes. Now, were the Jews, were the children of Israel at that time cognizant as a group as to the time of the Savior's arrival? Okay, ask that again. again. Were the children of Israel cognizant as a group of the time of the Savior's arrival, this this week of the seventy weeks. Well, it, it seems by the language in the New Testament that they were aware of it, but they just didn't know what exactly was going to go on. They, they, in fact, they looked to Barabbas as being um, their savior when they asked for him as far as, as opposed to Christ. So they were looking for a deliverer uh, in a man fashion, in a warrior type fashion, or, you know, cause wasn't that why he was in prison? In a way, yes, but that goes to a different part of what, what I'm trying to drive at. Okay, I'm sorry, what's your okay. point? When we when we go into the into the gospels with Matthew and with Luke, are we not told of Anna, the one that had been praying to see the day of the Savior, and who was the priest that had prayed that he would not be laid in the grave until he saw the Savior? Um, okay, that, wasn't that the one that lifted uh, Jesus up as a baby and yes. offered him to heaven? Right. Yeah. Simeon. Simeon. Simeon, that's it, Simeon. So you have Anna and Simeon. Now, I don't know what the gematria is of their names. But this occurred, as we're noting, at the very outset of the life of Christ upon this earth. My question in this situation, in dealing with all of this, is it possible that December 6th, when we had these issues with Future for America, is related to the lifting up of Christ as a baby? And is it possible that February 16th could be related to the baptism of those within the movement that are continuing to study in the manner in which God would have us to study? Well, I, I don't know if I'd make that application, but I mean, it's not impossible. But, um, so, you know, in Revelation 21, 17, because okay. we have this measuring of the city. Um, and he measured the wall thereof 144 cubits. Right. According to the measure of a man that is of the angel. Now we have this um six 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 it's the number of a man right right and then we have the hundred and forty four thousand it's the measure of a man but that is of the angel or the messenger right so we see this contrast between these two symbols
Well, <clears throat> the point right now, as we look at this with the 13th chapter of Revelation, mm -hmm. God gives a warning so that people can pay attention to that warning. Mm -hmm. He did this in the book of Daniel so that the children of Israel at that time would understand that they had been granted a time period of 70 times seven. So in, in a way of consideration, they are given a warning of 10 times the seven times by the seven times of Leviticus 26. You're given this warning of 490 years and shown here is the events of what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. Now we're being given a warning in the 13th chapter of Revelation. We are being told that Daniel and Revelation are one book. So if they are one book, <clears throat> wouldn't the examples given to us in the book of Daniel be related to what we're seeing here in the book of Revelation? Mm -hmm. We're dealing with chronological examples. Mm -hmm. Is what we're reading in the 13th chapter of Revelation another type of chronological examples for our consideration? Can you ask that question again, please? Sure. Is the warning being given to us in the 13th chapter of Revelation another type of chronological examples that we are being given for our consideration just as much as the ninth chapter of Daniel was given for the children of Israel for their time. Well, we would definitely have to say yes. I mean, all of these chronological details that have come out of the understanding of Adventism is, you know, to me, I mean, it's impossible to to deny i mean you can you know people deny things all the time but not logically and however however this has happened you know however adventist history has been tied to the past this analysis of something that we already understood we can see these details um this would this would be the confirmation that we need in order to move forward it's connected to the seal of God, just as this num the numbering of the beast is connected to the mark of the beast. Um, so, so if you go back to you know the idea there you're talking about with December sixth and and um, February sixteenth this year. So we see that there is in this movement a rejection of light. Well, it's more a, um, a rejection of the offer to examine light. Right. Right. So, so people are not willing to examine something because, well, whatever reasons they have, it doesn't really matter what the reasons are. I don't have but, enough time. 
yeah so they have all kinds of reasons they can be you know characters and personalities time complexity all these different reasons that are given which are similar to when jesus you know asked these people to come and follow him and they give varying excuses right so so this is just human nature and yet god has given us a warning and he's given us clear instruction on how we are to study and and what we are to study and and in this movement we've experienced his guiding hand and yet people will still have prejudice and thing, things in our lives that are unchristlike. Those are the things that are causing us to receive the mark of the beast. We're, we're developing. I think you're correct in that. Yeah, we're developing a character that is not after Christ, but after Satan. Mm -hmm. and, and, and we have to be careful, each one of us, in, in how we act and how we respond to light and how we deal with. Um, other people who are in our minds teaching error are we going to examine things and compare scripture with scripture and examine our own hearts or not <clears throat> so um, I was speaking with a, uh, a brother about a subject and um, uh, he was having problems with another brother, and the brother wanted to um, see his logic of things and answer some questions that he had, but he simply ignored him, and he told me that he ignored him, and so I see that um, uh, character flaw as being what you're talking about. Uh, we have the tendency to, well, I, I just don't wanna to talk to him. I, you know, I'm gonna ignore him. But um, I don't recall Jesus ignoring too many people that uh, in the scriptures. In fact, I don't recall him ignoring one. And so, I mean, aren't we supposed to use him as our example, our example? of the way we conduct ourselves and the, the straight testimony that's been given to us from the spirit of prophecy. Um, if we ignore those things or those examples, then you know we're ultimately cutting our nose off in spite of our face to use the vernac or use a, uh, an example. Um, and, we, and we do it, with the best of intentions. <laughs> I, well, I've done a lot of things with the best of my intent, at the best of intentions, but it took, it took a, um, um, an anger management class uh, to make me see things in a different light. Um, the, the anger, that I perpetuate upon people, you know, uh, is often um, from just habit. And so it's the correction of the habit. It, it's very, very difficult as you get older um, because it's kind of set in pretty good. Uh, but it's, it's a doable thing. It, you, you can do it. it. You just have to be tenacious um, in, your, in your application. That's just my word on that. That's not I, coming from I, God or anything. That's just coming from me. I always look to the example, really, when we're looking at the Millerite movement, you had Samuel Snow with his understanding of the 2520 finishing on a certain date. And you had William Miller with a 2520 finishing on a different date. And it was the combination of both of them that give us the understanding of, you know, what was being pointed out in the lines. And we always, within the movement, look at it. If you look at the light that you had before, our light should be progressive, not alter what came before. 
and the blending of, of the understanding of the two gives us more light. And what they seem to do is they hold on to one part of the truth, but they're not prepared to let the light of the opposite part of the truth help them to understand where they are. If that sounds, makes sense, yeah. All of our light is progressive. Daniel's light will lit the path that was behind John. Daniel and John are lighting the path that were behind Snow, Miller, and Ellen White. All of these together are lighting the path behind our time today. I agree, and uh, that is a good use of the example too, by the way. So our choices today relate to how we are going to accept the light that gives guidance to our path. Too many times we have had those that have had a bit of light and then chose not to walk further in that light. One example in this situation, as Elder Jeff would say, the revolutionary, as I would say very bluntly, Emiliano, gave us this light regarding Ezra 7 verse 9. Now, it may come as a surprise, but of us in this meeting today, what was Emiliano's birthday? Anybody know? I don't remember. I'd have I'd have to say no. October twenty two. July twenty first. Oh, so midnight. And so he would have, if he had continued, he would have come to not just understand the first day of the fifth month, but the fifth day of the fourth month and the significance of his birthday. Correct. Yeah. And of course, it's the same birthday you have. That's why you probably know it. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. It, it, it struck me hard. I mean, I have friends that their birthdays are the 20th of July. I have some whose birthdays are the 19th. I have some whose birthdays are much later in the month, but it did strike me very hard that we shared the same birth date. Of course, he is substantially younger than I am. Yeah. Now, we must all be careful because the light that God is giving us, we either collect it, acknowledge it, and accept it, or the light that we are being given will be removed. And that is a fearsome thought. How often are we allowed to reject the light that God gives us? Daniel gave a warning. Here is a warning for the children of Israel to understand. That this portion of the 2300 days was for them. 
those that choose to set aside the 2300 days being 2300 years are trying to say that in 490 days a warning was to be for just the children of Israel. Unfortunately, when we look at the way that this was handled, especially before Glacier View, instead of 490, they're making it into 245 days and nothing occurred. 245 days after this was being presented. We have to look, examine carefully for ourselves all of these warnings that are tied to time that are tied to chronology. Because if we are not willing to look to God, then we are choosing not God as our ruler. Because we only have the two classes, either those that follow Prince Emmanuel, or those that follow the Black Banner of the Great Rebellion. So when Mrs. White says, let us all read carefully the 13th chapter of Revelation, for it concerns every human agent, great and small. It doesn't mean, it does not matter to us if we are among the world's wealthiest, or if we are among those that are the meanest of the tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh. This falls to everyone. Every human being must take sides, either for the true and living God who has given to the world the memorial of creation and the seventh day Sabbath, or for that of the false Sabbath. Are we buying what they're selling? Are we accepting the examples that they are presenting? And are we then disseminating or selling their examples to the rest of the world? The Sunday law is going to break upon us as a great surprise. It's going to break upon the world as a great surprise. It's going to shock the world, all of us. I would agree. We are to do an analysis and evaluation of a Bible subject in order to form an understanding, not influenced by personal feelings or opinions in considering and representing facts as God would have us understand them. So I just rearranged some wording and added some wording to this is a this is what people in science do sure um and this to to me is science <laughs> in the highest form it is not science falsely so called yeah now There are many 
yet within the church, some yet within the fringes of this movement that believe that the Sunday law, when it, when it occurs, is going to be met where there will be those that immediately attempt to force us into compliance. The decision for compliance under this situation is being placed now by the method that we choose to study. Yeah, and, and we can see that it's not going to be something that we can just, you know, one day the Sunday law comes and we, we just say, oh, I'm going to, you know, keep keeping the Sabbath. Because we're already wandering, we've already are choosing, as you're saying, because we're wandering down a path that leads us in the wrong direction. And we should be aware of it, but we're not. What was the admonition that Joshua gave? Choose ye this day who you will serve. We're being given a choice. One of the points that I've had to look at, and I've had to look at it and consider it carefully, is those that are going to be known at the end will be a small sect little known to the world. And this will be the group that will be seen as being the quote, troublers of Israel. Does that description, little sect unknown to the world, does that represent the Seventh-day Adventist Church? I'd have to say no. Well, a remnant, a remnant of a remnant. Given We are the Seventh-day Adventist <clears throat> Church. Okay. But oh, yeah. Given the events before July 18th of 2020, would that be an apt description then of future for America? Yes. Yeah. Little known to the world? Little known to the world. At that time? Yeah, but now pretty much the whole world knows, but maybe not know us, us personally, but yes. Right. What I'm saying, as we, as we just heard, a remnant of a remnant. There are those that are going to choose to study according to the admonitions of Father Miller that are going to look at this in line upon line and accept the invitation to study and to consider carefully the passages that are put before them. There are those that are going to hear of this and decide, I don't need to study this way. I can rely upon my pastor. I can rely upon other men's writings. I can rely upon my own wisdom. I don't need to come together with others to study this subject. Father Miller was most willing to study. The 50 that remained after October 22, 1844, came together to study, to examine, to learn, 
to compare scripture upon scripture. Is that not what we are called to do today? Yeah. Yeah, I have to say, yeah. We are being called today to understand and to give witness to Palmoni, to the wonderful member, so that we can more properly and completely present before not only our friends that remain within the corporate church, but before the world itself, the reason for the faith that we have within us. If we're not willing to show the reasons for our faith, are we then being a witness for Christ? I'm sorry, question again. <clears throat> if we are not willing to show the reason for our faith, if we're not willing to present this before other friends and before the world, are we then being a true witness for Christ? I'd have to say no. Okay. However, yes, uh, the converted can be a, a witness um, just by their their godly character. What did I don't know how Noah witnessed, but she, the Ellen White made a comment about every hammer blow was a witness. Yep. So I mean, subjective question there, Bubba. <laughs> of course it was. But it's a question for consideration. Yeah. You have was, my answer. Was Noah's grandfather a witness? Um, yeah, by his name, wasn't it? Of course. But was his grandfather also there assisting in the construction of the ark? Uh, I believe we... I believe we, we have the uh, voice, of, I mean, the uh, spirit of prophecy that tells us yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> Methuselah, Lamech, and Noah. We have three generations. Representative of Fear God, give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. I agree. We have a representation of a chronological warning, for it was given to Noah that for 120 years, God was going to suffer for man to be upon the earth. God did not want anyone then to die. He wanted all to be saved. But the majority of the world made the choice to reject the word of warning. Even though this pointed not only to the time in which Methuselah would go into the grave, but to the time of the destruction of the world. This warning was given bluntly and directly. There was no guesswork about it. 
the warning that we have regarding the third angel's message of the choice between accepting the true Sabbath or accepting the spurious Sabbath is just as serious as the warning that was given to the antediluvian world. The Lord of heaven permits the world to choose whom they will have as ruler. Are we willing to accept that our Savior is the wonderful number and that this warning has just as much a valid time element as did that of Noah's, as did that of Daniel's, as did that of Elijah's. That's a choice that we each need to make today. Now, we have considered two paragraphs today. We have had a very open discussion, a very good discussion on everything that has been presented in just these two paragraphs. We have a few minutes remaining in our time together. Do we have any other comments or questions at this point? I think there is much more we could find in those passages in Luke 2, 21 through 40. I think I'll write to you guys about what I'm finding. Okay. And also where it says uh, the worship of a false Sabbath is a wedge that split the Protestant churches from God and left them naked. I mean, that's really serious. And they don't even know it, most of them. I mean, I have gone to Sunday keeping churches and because I'm a Sabbatarian, they were saying, uh, you know, they were downgrading the true Sabbath. And I should have stood up then. You know, I really should have, but I didn't. I, I just left. You know, when it was all done, I just left. It says left them naked. Well, then you have the spirit of Laodicea in place of seeing nakedness, spiritual nakedness. It's very much the same thoughts that I was having when I read this. Because are we not seeing that this worship leaving them naked adds to their blindness? Yeah, I, I always found it kind of weird in the reading history of the Protestant Reformation um, that they didn't just abandon um, the Sunday, that they held on to that, that tradition um, in spite of the fact they had no scriptural support. And they were able to abandon many other views that had come into Christianity. But this was, I mean, there were groups that, did hold to the true Sabbath, but this was a difficult one for people to uh, go against. I mean, I mean, I know there are some Christians who thought just that Sunday was the Sabbath. They didn't really um, think about it, but there were definitely Christians who knew better. And yet, you know, they didn't change their day of worship. Now, I always wondered about that. Why does this become the test? Um, you know, there's a book that was written. Uh, I know I have it on my computer. Um, I 
can't remember what it's called though. Um, but it was written uh, by, oh, what's the guy's name? Oh, man, I'm just so bad at remembering things. Um, but anyway, it was written a long time ago. A long time before Adventism, and it's, let me see if I can. What are the reformers? Or the reformers? Yeah, he was a yeah. Ron, your other mic was on there. Um, yeah, he was a. Um, you know, a, a nonconformist. Um, so it was quite a long time ago. I just can't, I, I know I retitled the book so that I could find it. Um, but I can't remember what I retitled it to. But it, it's quite interesting what he says about this controversy of the Sabbath. So you have somebody in like the 1600s recognizing uh, this the true seventh day Sabbath, and that that it's it's this controversy that's that's uh, and it uses a, a term similar to the great controversy. Um, you know, I just wish I could remember what I titled it as. It'd be interesting to see, interesting to see that book. Yeah, I have it in a PDF, but I just can't find it. Uh, is this something that you've sent out to us? I might have. Okay. Probably. I know I've sent it out at some time or other. But um, when, I don't know. Uh, I'm sorry about my echo. Uh, I lost my main computer for a moment. Well, for a couple, three minutes. And went to my phone and sorry. Okay. Throughout history, there have been those that have recognized the fact that the Bible is specific about the seventh day being the Sabbath of God. There are many that I have spoken with that choose to say, while well, yes, the seventh day is what is written in scripture, we choose to honor the day of Christ's resurrection because that's the day he rose. Christ honored the Sabbath by refraining from all labor. When he went into the grave again, he honored the Sabbath. Can we do anything less? So the great things that are done um, in honoring God are totally ignored by the vast majority. Exactly. That's not how they would look at it. As you know, they don't look at it that way. Agreed. They're so... Um, they, they don't realize the point that is necessary to understand. It's like they're, you know, they're, they're drunk on wine, they're blinded. But this also gives us a very clear picture of the false gods. Because if this spurious Sabbath is a false god. What 
other examples are we going to be able to find? Not only from scripture, but within our own lives of something that we are placing as being above God. There could be many, many things. Right. Different things with different people. Okay. Any other comments at this point? Okay, shall we then close with prayer? Gracious Father, without you, we can do nothing. The choice is being presented. The choice that is before us now, today, each one, day by day. May your will be done. May your character be replicated in our lives, in all that you would have us to do at this time of this earth's history. Be with us now. Direct us in the path that we should walk. May we understand more of the light that is behind us so that we may more clearly understand the light that will be shown before us, the light in which we need to walk, to walk to the path to your city, that which is to come. There are many that need prayer, Father. We need you. We seek you. May we each seek you with our whole heart. Be with us now. Be with those that will soon travel. Guide us in all things today so that we may more clearly and completely understand that which you would have us to know for this time. For this, Father, we thank you. We praise you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen.